some are actually beyond material uh, experiences of poverty. Some have to do with uh, feeling um, isolated, feeling uh, sometimes shame of the situation, sometimes uh, feeling uh, stress, and in, in, in many different ways that go beyond simply the material experience of poverty, beyond education, health, and so many other, other aspects. Yet, for some reason, the national figures of poverty that we still use are income poverty. And that's quite a contradiction, that we still are using income poverty when we all know that it's multi-dimensional. So the MPI that was launched by UNDP in 2010, and it was produced uh, together with uh, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiatives, particularly with Sabina Alcar and Emma Santos, um, that measure was a measure that um, was a measure of acute international <coughs> poverty. So it was a measure that aimed to uh, get, a, get a, 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 a sense of how was this, the situation of acute poverty. And the key here is that we're talking about acute poverty because it's very different type and phases of poverty. So um, the measure covers 109 countries and tried to replace the Human Poverty Index that was already included in the Human Development Report since, I think, 1995. Um, this new measure um, had the, the particularity that it goes and look at the individuals and the multiple deprivation that they suffer. The Human Poverty Index was actually looking at the dimension separately, but not on how people suffer multiple deprivation at the same time. So it covers other nine countries and it complements the MDGs in a sense that it covers different aspects that are also captured by the MDGs. So what is it exactly, or how, how, what is behind the, the, the MPI, as we call it? So, well, it's, it's measured with a particular type of, uh, of measure that is quite, um, um, that is, we call the, the adjusted headcount, which is a form of the account foster that fundamentally goes beyond simply saying the proportion of people that are poor, but also the, the intensity of the deprivation. So you know that people, perhaps 80% of the people are poor, but you all also know in how many dimensions the poor are deprived. And that's quite important. Why? Because if you're going to orient policies, you want, policy, you want to reward policies that focus on the poorest of the poor. That will be the, the poor that suffer from more number of dimensions together rather than simply focusing on some that are really close to the poverty level and then lift them in our poverty. So it's a measure that goes beyond that. And it covers um, three dimensions, the same as the, as the uh, human development index, health, education, and living standard, and 10 indicators. The 10 indicators are nutrition, <coughs> if at least one person in the household is malnourished, child mortality if at least one children have died, years of schooling is if, at least, if no one in the household has not even five years of schooling, if the kids or the children that are up to uh, year eight are not attending school, and then a series of living standard indicators, some related with cooking fuel, if they cook with dog, with um, wood, charcoal, if they don't have improved sanitation, measure has the MDGs or is uh, actually um, uh, share among uh, a group of people, uh, different households. If the water is not a safe, safe drinking water, also measure in terms of NDD, or if it's 30 minutes away, you have to fetch it and, and spend 30 minutes away to, to go and back. It's quite strict, if you, if you like. Electricity, if it doesn't have electricity, the flooring is, uh, is the earth flooring. And uh, an indicator of acid that is a uh, small acid uh, included. For those who are familiar with Latin America, this is a very, very acute type of poverty that is not as common in Latin America. Yet, some people are living under those conditions in Latin America. So what is key here is that not only in this room, but more broadly, most people would agree that that certainly is our level of deprivation that very strict. But yet it's not enough to be deprived in one to be multidimensionally poor. We say that it has to be deprived in a group such, we say 33%, which really is a combination such that is in at least one full dimension. So 
two indicators of one dimension are combinations such that it equivalent to one dimension. So it's even more strict in that sense. It's not enough to have electricity. You have to actually have enough indicator to be multidimensional. In that sense, really, no one would disagree that that is a very extreme situation of poverty. And so, let's see uh, one example here. It's actually a real person that we interviewed. She was deprived in years of schooling, in nutrition, and in five indicators of living standard. What we have here is the different indicators with their weight. Indicator of different weight. And here in the right hand, we have actually in, in, in how many indicator weight that, that person is deprived, is deprived, and it goes above the poverty level. So the person is considered multidimensionally improved by the measure. Yet, up to here, you would wonder, how can such a crude measure really capture the whole, the whole complexity of multidimensional report? And that's, that was precisely one of the great uh, big uh, questions that, that we had when the, the index was installed. And so we did a, a range of ground reality check in uh, several countries in the world. Some of those are in our website. And it consisted in, in being with someone, a household or an individual that was uh, poor according to partner that we have in the particular country, to be NGOs in that uh, uh, communities, and it was following that, those persons for a long period of time to try to see the experience of the poverty. Uh, one of those was a couple in Dominican Republic, Manuel and Lola, who had 10 years, a 10 years old uh, daughter. He was a farmer and, and worked three days a, a day a days as well in a, a in a laborer. He was um, cultivating plantain, uh, cassava, corn, and different, uh, different things. He was, uh, had to wait for a truck to come through close to his uh, house to sell the, the product that he had. The truck sometimes didn't come because the road was, um, was uh, not in very good conditions. And the wife, um, who was uh, very disappointed because she couldn't find a job. There were not many jobs in the area where she was. Um, they lost two kids. She had one, one daughter, but they lost two babies uh, uh, at birth, one of which they thought it was possible to avoid it. But they went to the doctor. Then the doctor sent them to the hospital. They went to the hospital. The hospital didn't attend them at the time. And they had to um, go back. They asked them to come the next day. The next day was just too late. So one of the things that they are very, very uh, conscious about is their need of, of, of health insurance. So she, she says, she says, life is not, not good. We need money. Not that, I, not that I need money, but we need money for doctors, she said. And so she's now in a group in, uh, with other women in the community where they are putting a pot of money that they are trying to use in a, in a in situation. So they are. Uh, yeah. You've got a couple of minutes. Okay, couple minutes. Wrap up, start wrapping up. Thank you. Um, but yet, they <coughs> suffer of multiple deprivations. They suffer of child mortality, nutrition as well, and a series of facets. And they are multidimensionally poor. This, you would say, of course, doesn't capture the whole complexity of their poverty, but it does at least reflect some of what it means to be multidimensionally poor. And so, some of the results that we obtained quickly um, of uh, five point, um, what is the figure? Uh, five point three billion people who are actually uh, included in the study, which cover ninety three percent of the developing country. One one point sixty five billion, thirty one percent, live under those conditions of multidimensional poverty, and from those, sixty percent live in. Uh, low middle income countries, which is quite quite striking. Also, 50% live in South Asia, 29% live in Sub Saharan Africa, and the poorest 20, 29 regions of South Asia in total have at least as, as, as many poor people as in the whole Sub Saharan, 26 Sub Saharan African states, which is quite a large, large number. Then, in terms of disparity, these are, are some of the upper middle income countries. Here you have um, the 
low middle income countries with a wide disparity between Georgia and Senegal that goes from 1 to 68 percent and here you have the low income countries from um, Kyrgyzstan to Niger which is a really wide disparity. Latin America it goes from Haiti that has 56 percent to uh, Uruguay and Argentina who have 2 percent. Colombia has around, uh, in 2010, had around 5% of people living under these conditions, similar to uh, Mexico and, and, and Brazil. Um, then, there are yet some quite wide disparities within countries. I'm not gonna, I don't have the slides here, but in the case of Colombia, it goes from Bogota, Medellin, or Cali, that have really low level of poverty, to regions like uh, Bolivar Sur, Sucre, Cordoba with 15% or Litoral Pacifico or Guajira, Cesar and Magdalena. So the disparities within countries are quite wide. Last year we did a, I, I cannot bring data from this year that we just finished because it's embargo and we're waiting for the report to be published, but last year we did an analysis on Colombia and Bolivia and among many other countries on changes of the time. And what we find is in Colombia, um, the, the reduction was quite significant, at least in relative terms. This is to say that Colombia started with not that high level of poverty. In comparison to Bolivia, Colombia had 9% of poor, whereas Bolivia had 36% of poor. And then uh, Colombia reduced from 9% to 5.4, which is uh, a rel in relative terms is 8.4% relative percent annually, which is quite similar to what Colombia and Bolivia did but Bolivia, in absolute numbers, reduced much more. Is that although it has one and a single figure, then you can also see how the dimensions are doing. So in the case of Colombia, you could see that uh, poverty was especially reduced in assets or in, a, in attendance, share mortality, nutrition, whereas in Bolivia, it was particularly in school attendance that reduced from 23% of uh, people living in household deprived to 4%. Now, just to finish, what's the progress even in Colombia across regions? Are all the regions benefiting in the same way? Well, some of, of our figure, and I think Yadira is going to be in a better position to expand on this, but we see that uh, some regions did incredibly well, like Pacifico, that went from 27% to 14% poverty, whereas other regions lag behind, like Orinoco and Amazonia, that it, it even, even looked that it went a little bit up in the, the total number of poor. So the API allowed this overall analysis and goes beyond them, the one dollar one, there and one and poverty measures. But yet, it's a measure for country comparison. So it allows you to look at the different 109 countries and to see uh, people who are living in, in Latin America and Colombia at just similar level than in other countries. But yet, um, what you would like is to have also a measure that is tailored to the country and that it can actually uh, reflect the type of poverty that exists in a particular country, where the dimensions that are in the country are the dimensions that are relevant for the people uh, uh, of the country, perhaps even for the poor and for those that live in the country that reach agreement on ending those type of deprivations. And so, the case, the case of Colombia is precisely going to be on this, uh, on this example. And, and there's another one in Mexico that maybe we'll, we'll have time to talk about. Thank you. I would like to, to share uh, uh, the overall experience of the Colombian government that the Colombian government had uh, using and actually adapting uh, a version of the MPI that just uh, Jose uh, spoke about it and um, how we use it for the for public policy purposes and how nowadays is institutionalized in, in our context. As as all uh, all of us might know um, in in Latin America there is a long experience in multidimensional um, multidimensional measures like the unsatisfying basic needs index or the for example for the um, 
a specific case of Colombia, the living condition <coughs> index that uh, Cathy uh, mentioned. Uh, but uh, back in 2010, uh, the Colombian government realized that those measures were kind of obsolete because they didn't uh, depict uh, properly the living conditions of the of the population, and more than that, they didn't um, show like different like differences uh, among the population, so they were not not, not useful anymore. So at that time, um, the Colombian government uh, started to work uh, with OFI. And, and then uh, start to develop its own uh, multidimensional poverty uh, measurement uh, under the guidance of, of uh, under the technical guidance of OFI. And then we ask ourselves uh, the, the same questions that we've been talking here: how to how to define poverty, how to uh, how to conceptualize poverty for for our uh, specific con context. And then uh, we came up with something. Um, first of all, uh, we, we, we conceptualize poverty, thinking in poverty as a multidimensional phenomenon, but uh, that it's not only a made of uh, income, um, that it's not only made of income dimension, uh, but it's not only made of non-income dimensions. So both of them are important and both of them are um, complementary. Uh, taking this into account, a multidimensional measure uh, of non-income um, of non-income well-being dimensions was designed, and then was designed across uh, defining uh, five dimensions, and across those five dimensions. Uh, 15 indicators. I'm not going to go through all the list of indicators because I think we don't have time for this, but then uh, I will mention uh, the, the, the five dimensions. So the first one, it's a, um, the first one is um, education and education and, and living conditions in, at the household. Uh, the, se the second one is uh, the Childhood and, and youth uh, living conditions. Uh, the third one, uh, it's um, a health. And the, the fourth one, it's employment. And the fifth one is um, living, let's say, dwelling conditions. All of them, uh, uh, are, as, as they are in the indicator, all of them are experienced for the, by the household at the same time. So. And all of them uh, has uh, have the same the same weight. So it, all of them are equally valu valuable uh, by the household. Um, one important thing I, uh, in the moment of the design of the of the indicator was that the main aim of the indicator uh, was to uh, serve as public policy tool, and uh, therefore each of the variables that uh, are uh, in the indicator are uh, meant to be uh, able to be um, to be changed by, by the government or by any of the public policies that the government uh, works on. Uh, therefore, uh, each of the dimensions and each of the of the indicators can be changed uh, and can be uh, let's say can be improved in in a certain way. And uh, in that way, uh, we make <coughs> the indicator to be a, a public policy tool so we could uh, develop, a, we could uh, track a, the a poverty levels across time and also we, we can work towards a main, uh, a main goal that uh, put together resources from different uh, institutions in the government. So let's say uh, there is the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Education has its own plan and the Ministry of Health uh, has its own plan. But then each one works in its own plan, but then also there is a common goal to, to achieve. And, the, and, and this goal is towards a, po a, a poverty reduction. Um, this measure, um, as, a, as, uh, as I'm, I'm highlighting here, it's, uh, it was designed in terms of public policy. And therefore, uh, and, uh, in order to be sustainable over time, it needed um, 
like let's say a background, an institutional background. Um, then uh, after the design of the of the tool as a as a poverty monitoring a tool, um, an institutional background uh, was uh, uh, constructed, and then uh, now in 2012, uh, the the 150 com uh, compass document a uh, compass. Um, was enacted, uh, and then within this compass, the, the 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 measure is official, and actually not only the measure, also the methodology, the variables, the weights, everything. So what what does it mean? This means that over the time, um, the measure cannot be changed just because uh, like one government uh, come and then other goes. So the 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 methodology is a, it can be a stable over time. Um, this in terms of uh, multidimensional poverty, but also uh, in terms of income poverty, because within the same document, uh, uh, the, the official uh, methodology to, to measure income poverty was included. Also, in that document um, was a institute, institutionalized uh, a main committee to monitor poverty uh, over the over the over the country, and uh, this this committee uh, it's at the highest level, and it is meant to uh, meet every six months, and then is made of each of the ministries that have uh, indicators that can be changed uh, uh, because they they public policies. So then the committee is made of the Ministry of Health. A Ministry of Labor, a Housing, Agriculture, Education, Finance, uh, the National Planning Department. So each of the uh, each of the ministries meet and then uh, work together, um, tracking the tracking tracking how each of the indicators have been at, uh, have been uh, uh, advancing over the time, or how each of the indicators uh, is behaving. And then uh, it can be. It, it, then it, each each ministry can 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 be with either red light, a green light, a yellow light, regarding its its behavior uh, over the time. Um, this is in terms of let's say uh, like high level monitoring, but also uh, but also technical monitoring is important. So yeah, you have um, three minutes. But also, uh, uh, te technical monitoring is important. Uh, then, in the same compass, uh, it was created a uh, two technical committees, uh, and these two technical committees, the main aim of them um, was to uh, monitor that the that the methodology, the val the variables, and the way to to think about poverty uh, was constant uh, over the time. And these technical committees uh, work uh, one for, for multidimensional poverty, another for unidimensional poverty. They work uh, and they meet uh, regularly over time. Finally, uh, the measure it's only it's, it's also uh, used uh, for the national development plan. And uh, actually, the, the main goal of, of poverty reduction was set. Uh, using using the using the tool and actually each of the the sectors that has uh, variables that can be um, th that can be affectable um, they they have um, they have within within its own goals uh, goals that needs to be tracked over time in order to achieve the overall the overall goal of uh, poverty reduction. Okay, but this in figures, I, what does it mean? Uh, in figures, uh, we are having uh, in 2000, this is according to national figures, uh, in 2011, um, we have 34% of income poverty, and then 29% uh, of multidimensional poverty. If we think in, in terms of uh, population, this is this is still uh, like a, a great challenge. Uh, we are still with, uh, like roughly uh, 15 uh, million of uh, persons living under um, income poverty, or uh, like 13 million uh, persons living under um, multidimensional poverty. So the, the challenge are not only uh, the challenge. Uh, the challenge is great. It's, it's very big. 
in terms of levels, but it's not only in terms of levels, it's also in terms of, of the distribution, as Jose was uh, like saying before. Why? Because um, when, we, when we compare the, the, the figures across time, uh, we can see that, yeah, we, uh, Colombia have, have, uh, can, can show a, a declining trend uh, of poverty over time. But uh, the difference between, let's say, urban and rural areas are, are, are huge. Um, nowadays, for example, uh, 23, of the, uh, 23 of the population in urba urban areas are poor, whereas this same figure for the rural, rural areas is 53%, which is uh, like almost twice. So the, the difference is, uh, even though the, the trend is a, the trend of poverty is a, a, a reduction trend, the, the differences between urban and rural areas uh, has been uh, increasing. So the, the main challenge uh, is not only is not only uh, the level of poverty, but it's also uh, in terms of um, in terms of inequality, in terms of uh, the gap between. Uh, a, a families, and uh, finally, uh, uh, the other deal to account, and it's in terms. Okay, yeah, we have multidimensional poverty, we have income poverty, but both of them are uh, are, are reducing over time, but not at the same speed. So, whereas whereas a, a, we have like a very like a, like a, a, let's say whereas in a uh, multidimensional poverty reduces faster than income poverty income poverty uh, it seems like it's kind of a stagnant so the third the third main challenge that I think uh, needs to, to be taken into account it's in terms of uh, income <coughs> income generating programs because uh, nowadays uh, okay uh, families are uh, can, can go easily out um, is not easily, sorry, easier out of uh, multidimensional poverty rather than uh, income poverty, which is, a, in the Colombian perspective, is equally important. So finally, to, to summarize, uh, I would like to say that, I would like to highlight that, yeah, uh, uh, indeed, uh, the, the exercise of uh, multidimensional poverty, it was, it's, it was very helpful and actually is very helpful for the Colombian government in order to put together uh, not only resources but uh, mostly actions in terms of each of the institutes and each of the agencies that work towards the same goal. So it's very important but then uh, there are still a great challenge to, to be taken into account. As uh, Children of the Andes uh, has long experience, 21 years experience of working with children living in poverty in Colombia. Um, over this time we've, we've had the privilege of hearing the stories of, of children and, and their families and with their consent we've, we've collected these uh, into an archive of, um, of personal testimony. So I've, I've taken the opportunity of this, this forum to look back at around 400 of, of these uh, <coughs> personal testimonies of, of children and families talking about their experience of, of poverty and deprivation uh, in Colombia to see what they might tell us about the importance of, of a multi-dimensional uh, way of looking at, of measuring uh, and understanding poverty. So, um, unlike, for example, Kathy's work, uh, my analysis has in no way been systematic and still less scientific. So it's just it's my perspective on, on what these testimonies might tell us about, about the importance <coughs> of looking at poverty multidimensionally. I'm not going to use that word again because I've run out of time. Um, so, uh, so since the MPI um, sets out to go beyond measuring poverty, uh, measuring income poverty, and I thought I'd look first of all at, at how income poverty uh, appears in, in the words of, of the children and the families that, that, we've, that we've heard over the years at, at the Children of the Anders. So um, what might not be surprising to anybody, if you've been listening to the previous speakers, is that 
um, income poverty doesn't really figure that much. Um, only in about 10% of the, the 400 or so uh, testimonies that, that I um, looked back at um, is, is income or money or, or any uh, mention of, of money uh, does it appear. So uh, not only is, it, is income poverty per se totally absent from <coughs> most of what uh, children and, and adults talk about when they're talking about uh, their experience of the poverty and liberation. Not only is it totally absent, but even when it is mentioned, it's almost always uh, in the context of some other aspect of, of deprivation, which, is, uh, which appears at least uh, as important to people's experience of, of poverty. So um, even though we told some people they weren't allowed to have slides, I also have some slides, <laughs> uh, but I only have a few. Um, <laughs> it's hardly multi-dimensional. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> so let's um, start with uh, an example. Um, yes. uh, this, is, this is a boy who we'll call Pedro. His real name is not Pedro, um, for the child tax reasons. Um, but anyway, uh, this, is, this is a bit of his story. Uh, he, he um, was forced to flee his home uh, when his father was, was threatened by the Gadija. And he says, um, I'm not going to read it all out. It's in Spanish, as you can probably tell. Uh, I'm going to speak in English, and you can probably tell that as well. Uh, but I'm going to read a bit of it. Anyway. Um, my parents had nowhere for us to go. And there were days when we had to endure cold and, and hunger. It was so hard to get anything to eat that one day, my dad got us a panela, which is a, a sort of cake of um, uh, uh, sugar cane. Sugar. 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 And, and I ate a little bit without permission. And he was so angry that to teach me a lesson, he took a hot coal from the fire and held it against my arm, leaving me with an ugly scar for life. My mum cried and cried because there was no money to take me to the doctor. So evidently, lack of income is at the forefront of, of Pedro's concerns here. Um, but, but this and, and the hunger and cold that obviously follow from that are, are the context for, for what to him appear at least as significant aspects of his deprivation, uh, namely mistreatment by his father and, and witnessing the despair of his, of his mother. It's, and this is, a, this is a very good example of the way that people in, in in these testimonies, talk about what it is to be to be poor, to be living in the uh, As I say, that, that, that people express their experience in terms of of sort of non-income uh, deprivations. They are often psychological rather than you know, sort of objective. Uh, often uh, subjective, in fact, obviously, because partly because they're talking about their life, and that's what you would expect. But anyway, um, so income poverty, I say, is, if it's not the overriding concern in, in these testimonies, what is how, I thought then I'd look at how some of the variables under some of the dimensions of the Colombian MPI, how they appear um, in, in these testimonies. Uh, as you might expect, uh, the relationship to school, uh, children's relationship to, with, with uh, with education, I think it's very high. Um, you might expect this because many of children of the Andes' uh, partner projects work explicitly uh, on education. So, of course, uh, children are likely to be talking about uh, that relationship. Nevertheless, I think the testimonies um, certainly show how uh, a, a child's relationship to school, to schooling, um, and often their exclusion from schooling has a profound effect on their well-being and that of their family. Um, I think the other aspect that comes out when we're talking about children, when children are talking about their, their relationship to school, is how relationship to education profoundly affects other aspects of their, of their deprivation. Um, so here's, a, here's another example. Um, this is the uh, 
Cat Carolina story, again, it's not her name, her real name. Um, she, Carolina's mother died when she was four. Uh, she went to live with her aunt and her grandmother, and um, times were hard. Uh, so when she was nine, she says, uh, at that age, I had to go out to work to help them make ends meet. I couldn't go back to school because the money that I earned was, was for all of us. I, I felt different from everyone else. I felt embarrassment and shame because I, I saw the other kids going to school and playing, and I felt frustrated and, and directionless, seeing time passing and my life staying the same. So I thought that that was my future and that I didn't have the right to play or to any fun at all. As time went on and, and as I saw that every day the money went less and less, at the age of 13 I agreed to work in prostitution. So uh, having said that income poverty isn't the overwhelming concerns in, in these testimonies, um, I've selected another testimony where obviously it does fit. Uh, in fact. But again, uh, it's obvious here that there's a lot more going on in Carolina's life and her experience of poverty uh, than just lack of income, um, orphanhood, exclusion from education, child labour, feelings of, of frustration and hopelessness and, and shame, and ultimately sexual exploitation. And in her case, although uh, you don't see it here in uh, the testimony, early motherhood. Um, so, as Carolina describes her, her, her deprivation, um, clearly income poverty precipitates uh, a lot of her, of what she experiences, deprivation. But, missing out on school and having to work, which are two of the, of the uh, variables in, in one of the dimensions of the Colombian MPI, loom at least as large in her experience of poverty. Um, and I think an interesting thing uh, about it also is that they, they, they appear to increase her vulnerability to other deprivations independently of, or at least in addition to, the effect of income poverty. Um, this, is, this is consistent, uh, it occurred to me, with, with the experience of one of our partner organisations, uh, Ben Nasir, who work on um, uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, they, their experience is that feelings of hopelessness and, and even worthlessness, which in the case of Carolina here, clearly results to some extent, to a large extent, from her exclusion from school, from her exclusion of, from doing what other children do. Uh, this feeling of worthlessness often makes children more vulnerable to, to sexual exploitation. Um, okay, you've got it. Okay, sorry, just right. Uh, does anybody else have five minutes more? Will you? Uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, at this point, you have a couple of minutes, and everybody but now has three minutes more. So, yes, right, okay. effectively, but I will stop right. right. <laughs> um, so, one more, let's look at one more testimony. Um, these are the words of a 13-year-old girl, um, we we'll call her Anami Lee. She attends a project in, in Cali, Passi Bien, uh, which aims to help young people escape the cycle of poverty, and specifically to protect themselves against the violence of the armed groups uh, which pervade their, their neighborhood in, in Agua Blanca in, in Cali. Um, she says, I like the street because I have lots of problems at home. The nagging is, is the worst thing. That's why I prefer to be in the street. But sometimes I've, I've had to run to escape getting caught in the middle of the boys' shootouts. There are so many of us in the house that there's no time for anything. There's only fighting and abuse. My mother is a single mother and I'm the fifth of ten children crowded into two bedrooms and one living room. How can I stay there when I'm suffocating for lack of space? That's why I stay in the street with my friends, to give me advice, even though they often have the same problems as I do. And my other brother's drug taking is tearing us apart little by little. That's why I prefer to stay out on the street and escape all my problems. 
problems at home then are clearly a very significant part of an army less poverty, overcrowding, uh, which I understand is, is actually one of the um, uh, variables in the Colombian MPI. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it is. Yeah. Um, is clearly a factor in pushing her into the dangers of the street. Um, arguments and mistreatment at home clearly worsened by the overcrowding of other aspects of her deprivation and the backdrop is, is the spectre of her, of her brother's quite possibly violent death, although she doesn't say so, and her other brother's involvement with drugs. So as well as overcrowding, uh, insecurity, violence and, and drug use also figure as aspects of Anna Miller's deprivation. And, and they also further increase her exposure to these risks as she seeks consolation in her compañeras on, on the street. So I think hers is another example of the relevance of, of the MPI variables to understanding poverty. A measure of her family's income alone would give us no understanding of, her, of, the, of the significance of her family, of her home situation. Uh, and it would give us no clues as to how to address this complex uh, deprivation, multiple deprivations that she, she suffers. Um, it suggests, this, this testimony, that poverty is made up of a number of semi-independent dimensions. Um, it also suggests, I think, that there is, that there is a, a complex interaction of these dimensions, both the objective dimensions that, that the MPI seeks to measure, and also uh, more subjective experiences, like, like boredom uh, and despair. Um, so I'll just quickly give what I think of my conclusions about what these testimonies show us about the importance of MPI. Um, I'd say that they show that it's relevant and important for the following reasons. Um, as Cathy said, for example, they show that poverty and deprivation simply are multi-dimensional. Uh, they're comp it's complex and it's diverse, both in terms of the objective uh, dimensions and in terms of how people experience deprivation and poverty. Um, and again, this is, I guess, what we might expect, but uh, the testimonies show that non-income poverty, uh, non-income dimensions of poverty, loom at least as large in people's experience of, of poverty as, as simply lack of income. Um, another important thing I think that the, the testimonies show is how different dimensions of poverty interact in complex uh, and diverse ways for different people. Uh, the, I think the MPI is, MPI is important because it identifies different dimensions and it quantifies them. And, and therefore it opens up the possibility of, of a better understanding of how different dimensions interact, <coughs> and therefore the possibility of more sophisticated multi-dimensional anti-poverty programs. Uh, so, and the last reason I think uh, MPI and a multi-dimensional approach to understanding poverty is, is important is because be the way that the testimonies show the multi-dimensionalness, attitude, attitude, multi-dimensionalness. Uh, anyway, of, of poverty and, and the interaction between the different dimensions of poverty. Um, this suggests very strongly that poverty can't really be understood or, or combated without reference to and action in several different dimensions simultaneously. I think that's one of the very important parts of um, the MPI approach. I was going to say a bit about what testimonies show that uh, it's not in the, the MPI, but perhaps we'll, we can talk about that later. The floor question is great. Thank Thanks you very much. Uh, I don't see any hands. Yes. People are shy. They will. There's one here. It's <coughs> rather an interesting question. In the 1970s and 80s, following the big miners' strike in this country, the government closed down most of our coal mines and started importing cheap coal from Latin America. I found out that this involved using child slave labor working in the mines, very possibly including in Colombia. I went and had to be rallied by a member of parliament about this. And my question is, does this still happen? Thank you. Okay, we, we'll take um, 
questions or comments in groups of three. So the next one is the gentleman here. Yeah, in the great talk. Uh, what? Yeah, and what is related to these uh, MPIs? All the components are really correlated, each one with each other. So I would like to know if, um, like, given the the last tag uh, suggestion, if we provide uh, like some type of program that uh, generate that makes households to generate income <coughs> alone and uh, a system to, to allow people to assist to, to make their children, to assist to schools that will solve poverty, according to, to this. So if, there is, if I provide income, that it will be enough to solve for poverty, or not? That's, that's a big Okay, um, any other questions, or shall we take those two? Okay. And I think, as everyone has said, it's an extraordinarily um, complex matter, uh, both measuring and also dealing with poverty. So we've touched on a whole range of issues in this um, discussion today. But I think overall, this is about the MPI, and I think it's a very uh, important development of uh, a new range of methodological tools for identifying um, forms of poverty that exist. and. Governments and policymakers should listen to uh, the findings of these methodologies, which do go beyond the sort of standard um, income uh, measures of poverty and deprivation. And what the MPI will assist governments in doing is to be able to not only identify these extremely uh, deprived people, pockets of more extensive uh, concentrations of people in, in, in great poverty, but also to identify the forms of deprivation, the principal forms of deprivation that they suffer from, so that if it happens to be nutritional poverty or it happens to be uh, the fact that they're living in poor housing, here is a way that NGOs and uh, civil society and uh, concerned others can actually put pressure on governments to do something about it. So I think it's, it's, it certainly helps to refine the means by which uh, activists can, can influence policy, as well as governments can be made sensitive and attuned to uh, the forms of deprivation that their citizens suffer from. So congratulations uh, to you, Jose, and your colleagues for uh, doing so much good work on that. I think the other thing that came out actually is the sort of issue of variations, I mean geographical ge variations in terms of these concentrations of poverty. And it, it sort of invites us to think a little bit about why does that happen. Uh, what we find very often is that these concentrations of extremely poor people are to do with things like spatial uh, remoteness, uh, but they're also to do with, with long-term historical patterns of uh, deprivation that are built into the colonial model uh, that Latin America had imposed uh, through the colonial situation that led to large concentrations of indigenous population being pretty marginalized from uh, some of the kind of main centers of economic development. And even today in the Andes, we see that some of the most <coughs> acute forms of deprivation are to do with this spatial segregation, which is also, of course, political, civil, and social. The sort of work that I've been doing as well in the Andes on poverty revealed this very, very clearly, and again, we see these concentrations of, of very, very poor people who have uh, certainly agency, they're very vocal about what they want to see changing. And we have seen in Bolivia, of course, that that's assumed quite active political form. But nonetheless, we have very deeply entrenched forms of marginalization uh, and deprivation in these populations, which are also, of course, when you break them down, you find what uh, Kathy pointed out, that there's also kind of gendered elements within certain forms of acute poverty and deprivation. You only have to look at, for example, maternal mortality. Uh, the indicators for which are not very encouraging is one of the MDGs uh, in Latin America, which has excelled in some areas in terms of female participation, for example, in politics, but it has not excelled in terms of uh, reducing the maternal mortality rate. And of course, that is another indicator that sensitizes to the fact that children are also very deprived. When women are, 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 are women's maternal roles are, uh, uh, suffer, suffer in this way, and maternal health suffers, you can be sure that children suffer too and suffer for a lifetime. So these issues of gender and of poverty as well as, of course, 
these uh, more material forms of deprivation that, that can be tackled. Now, I also think, you know, we, we, we can be pleased that these methodologies are developing, particularly at a time when, you know, we are going to need to keep track of poverty very carefully, given the situation that Latin America and other developing countries are in, and are going to be in over coming years as a result of the global recession. Certainly they've got their commodity boom, <coughs> but there's also rising food prices, which uh, on one estimate that came out of CEPAL will produce another 10 million people, possibly, it's an estimate, it's a guess, uh, over coming years, who are suffering greater levels of deprivation. So again, we need to track this. We need to keep pressure on governments uh, that, for example, cash transfers, the fatal <coughs> form of relieving poverty, do not just stay at the same level. You know, we're going to have to say they need going up if people can't afford uh, to live on uh, and meet their nutritional needs, but <coughs> they're too poor to do so. We know, for example, also that um, you know, 70, over 70% of uh, developing countries have actually cut their public spending budgets by 3%. And that is going to have an effect on uh, poverty uh, and on people's access to public goods. So these things are very important. I want to say just summarize a few of the points that came up in relation to um, how much time have I got? Uh, <laughs> I'm not on five, five minutes. Well, huh? Four or five minutes. <laughs> Okay. Speed up a little bit here. Um, a few points that came up over, over from from all of you and from the uh, speakers about this sort of multi-dimensional um, measures and how important they are for capturing things that are not seen in the kind of raw statistics. And it does. I mean, I'm involved as well in a big multi-dimensional poverty tracking project, which has got, as Kathy's did, participatory elements in it. And actually, one of the things that's coming out of that research very interestingly is, um, again, you know, these variations in people's perceptions of how poor they are, but also their perceptions about what the priorities are. And uh, some of these things are very hard to get at, but over and over again, one of the things that matters, we were talking about what matters to people, is dignity and self-respect. This happens to come up more and more in, uh, for example, very deprived populations, indigenous people. Uh, this came up very strongly in some research I did a couple of years ago. The way people are treated by the very people who are supposed to be helping them uh, to escape from poverty is a major problem. And people feel very angry about that. And that's something that has to go back to the people who deliver these services in order to change the ways that they behave to people. But also, you know, in simple developmental terms, it increases, you know, the effectiveness of programs if they, if, if you know, uh, the program people actually listen to these complaints and do something about it. And I have to say that one of the things that's very interesting now is that we're getting quite a lot of buy-in by the big donors into what's called social accountability. How many of you know what social accountability is for your hands up? Anyone? No? Okay, some of you do. It's about actually kind of building into projects the mechanisms that will actually um, ensure that people's voices are heard, that people can actually have effective complaints mechanisms, they can make it clear to people uh, what their priorities are, what their needs are. It would be very interesting to see if this actually happens, because even the World Bank has said this is a good thing, partly because it's, you know, dear old value for money, it does actually uh, increase effectiveness, uh, but it's also part of a kind of more, if some people call, perhaps ironically, the ethical turn in development, but it is about listening to the poor and, and trying to be more effective in dealing with their concerns. Just one thing about um, poverty. Um, some people ask the question, it is falling, yes, and congratulations to Colombia and to uh, nearly all Latin American countries actually reducing poverty, but is it sustainable? Is the downward trend sustainable? Well, it's, it's a big question, as I touched on before, but also we know that the figures we get don't actually provide a, a very accurate perception of, of poverty because poverty is a dynamic condition. People move in and out of poverty. And so we need to also be aware that, um, you know, what is it that makes people vulnerable to poverty? What is it that puts them at risk of poverty? That's just as important a question as identifying uh, the numbers of people who are in poverty and why they're in poverty. So I think that question of vulnerability was touched on by a number of people in the audiences. And actually, that too is being uh, measured and is being discussed in the kind of arenas of public policy and outside. 
It's very important, my final point, truly you'll be glad to hear, um, because everyone needs a drink and I'm going to invite everyone to have one with us in a moment. But one of the important things here is that if you take countries at the same level of per capita income and you look at how effective they are in dealing with child poverty, you see enormous variations. And why is that? That's because governments and other factors buy into dealing with these problems effectively. Most of the countries that have greater success have integrated social policy or social welfare programs. I'll give you three examples very quickly. Uzbekistan has 2% child poverty rate. Uh, India has 58%. Now, if you kind of think about that, there's very huge differences between these two countries. Uzbekistan, for all its many failures politically, actually had something like a safety net, which is not entirely eroded these days. So I think, you know, again, these are macro questions. Someone said on the table, you've got, Kathy, I think, said you've got to think about government's responsibility for these things and for putting, you know, what we can do is put pressure on governments to make sure that uh, the voices of the poor are heard and their problems are delivered. They are delivered from their problems more effectively. So on that note, um, I will say this has been a great uh, uh, event. Thanks to all of you for coming and speakers. And uh, let us now go and have a drink and continue but, uh, this I'm still worried about Judy. I'm not sure yes. what Judy is going to do. I don't know how many teams mention wine. You all want to kill me. You're like, just yes, shut up. Sorry. I want to go next door. <laughs> So just a very, very quick summary of what I have done. So as we've had the speakers today, I've been drawing pictures. So when you came in earlier, this was blank here. And what you didn't know is that Heidi, when she was at the Olympics, she was a volunteer, one of the games makers, changers. So the welcome that you got in here was Olympic standard. She was there, discussing. They do this, and then this, and then she the So yeah, it's round of applause for the opportunity to see this when we go through to the wine, which is any minute now, I promise. <laughs> and there are three sections, so it talks based on the, the talks that we've had here. So it's about what is poverty, looking at the, um, the context that's led to the MPI. Then I've got a little bit of an idea about what that is there. And finally, looking at the Colombian context and some of the quotes as well from the children. There are little bits I've got to add yet, but you'll, you'll be able to come and talk to you as well if you want to. Okay. Yes. Thank you.